Preparations for Starship Flight 4 are in full swing at Starbase, with the ship, booster, and launch pad gearing up for the wet dress rehearsal and subsequent flight test. Simultaneously, tank farm upgrades have entered the next phase, marked by the removal of a vertical storage tank. Over at Massey's, SpaceX has initiated the installation of the static fireflame deflector. Additionally, SpaceX has commenced booster testing for Flight 6 and aims for nine launches this year. Join us as we delve into these latest developments. Following the successful static fire test campaigns, Starship 29 and Super Heavy Booster 11 prototypes, which will be launched on the fourth integrated flight test, are undergoing preparation for the wet dress rehearsal. Ship 29 is receiving heat tile upgrades inside the high bay. All the tiles removed from the nose cone have been replaced with new ones lately. Meanwhile, more tiles have been removed from the flaps and from various locations on the ship's windward side that experience the maximum re-entry heating. Some areas where tiles were removed have new adhesive patches placed, as these areas require the tiles to be glued on. Other areas of the ship have tiles mechanically attached with the help of pins. Insights from Flight 3 data likely influenced this upgrade. A successful ocean splashdown of Ship 29 with all of its systems working is one of the major milestones of Flight 4. New tiles with better adhesives will ensure Ship 29 survives atmospheric re-entry during IFT-4. Meanwhile, Booster 11 is undergoing thorough inspections, checkouts, and assembly verifications on a processing stand inside the Mega Bay. The hot stage ring is currently staged outside the Mega Bay for installation on the booster. Upon readiness, Ship 29 and Booster 11 will be transported to the launch site for the full-stack wet dress rehearsal. A successful wet dress rehearsal will set the stage for the fourth integrated flight test, currently targeted for next month. Launch pad repairs and upgrade works are continuing at the launch site. The hose that delivers liquid methane to the Super Heavy booster has been replaced once again, though the reason remains unknown. Both the methane and oxygen hoses, damaged during IFT-3, were previously replaced in March, ahead of Booster 11's static fire test on April 5. It's possible that the new methane hose sustained damage during that static fire, prompting SpaceX to replace it again. In addition to the hose replacement, at least 10 of the booster hold-down clamp linkages and the front bore of the booster quick disconnect mechanism were replaced in recent weeks. On Wednesday evening, the launch mount detonation suppression system underwent testing. This system is engineered to purge the launch mount with high-pressure nitrogen gas and water, effectively cleaning and preventing the accumulation of any volatile propellant mixtures beneath the launch mount before engine ignition. Additionally, workers were observed working on the Starship Quick Disconnect Arm in preparation for the forthcoming full-stack wet dress rehearsal. As per the mission plan, Booster 11 is slated to execute a simulated landing in the Gulf of Mexico during the fourth integrated flight test, maneuvering as if it was aiming to be caught by the launch tower arms. In other words, the booster will act as if there were a virtual tower out in the ocean. If that maneuver is successful, SpaceX intends to attempt catching the booster with the tower arms as early as Flight 5. However, before catching the Starship with the tower arms, SpaceX requires two successful soft landings on water. Over the past three weeks, extensive repairs and upgrades have been underway on the launch tower arms to enhance their speed and reliability for catching ships and boosters in future missions. Recently, an actuator was removed from the left arm and replaced with a slightly upgraded version. The actuator plays a crucial role in precisely controlling the horizontal movement of the launch tower arms, governing their opening and closing actions. This functionality is essential for both stacking the launch vehicle on the launch mount and facilitating rocket catching. At the tank farm, work to bring the horizontal propellant storage tanks online is progressing at a faster pace. The eight tanks dedicated to liquid methane storage have been operational for over a year, and efforts are now focused on activating the nine newly installed tanks for liquid oxygen and nitrogen storage. Originally, the tank farm comprised eight vertical tanks for propellant, water, and liquid nitrogen storage. However, the tanks designated for methane storage remained unused due to regulatory approval issues and were later repurposed for water storage. In January, one of the original methane tanks and the water tank were scrapped as part of the tank farm upgrade. The second methane tank was scrapped this past week. Initially, the outer protective shell of the tank was dismantled into two large pieces and removed with a crane, as opposed to January's method of removing it in one piece. This change was necessary because SpaceX had added external bracing to the shell after the second flight test in November to enhance its structural integrity for withstanding the extreme conditions during Starship liftoff. This bracing altered the center of gravity of the shell, making it challenging for the crane to lift it in one piece. Following the shell's removal, 
the stainless steel storage tank was lifted from its stand and subsequently scrapped by cutting it into pieces with cutting torches. Currently, SpaceX is in the process of scrapping another tank, which was previously used to store liquid nitrogen for launch pad operations. Based on the latest developments, it can be inferred that all the vertical tanks will be fully decommissioned and the new horizontal tanks will be fully operational within a few months, potentially before the fifth flight test. Once the vertical tanks are removed, SpaceX will have adequate space at the tank farm to install the newly delivered heat exchangers and small bullet tanks. The bullet tanks will store water in the future, while the heat exchangers, in conjunction with the new pumps, will enhance the speed of fuel loading into the launch vehicle. Construction of the static fire test stand and flame trench at the Massey's test site is making rapid progress. The Starship Quick Disconnect mechanism, responsible for supplying propellants, gases, electric power, and communication signals to the ship during static fire testing, was installed on the test stand a week ago. This image provides an insight into how the quick disconnect is positioned over the flame trench, where the ship will be moved and connected for testing. Simultaneously, work on the flame trench and flame deflector is advancing at Massey's. The flame deflector will be constructed out of these three sections that were delivered to Massey's a few weeks ago. Two of the deflector sections were placed into the flame trench the past week. The third and final section will be placed inside the trench in the coming days and will be welded together with the already installed sections to complete the flame deflector. The deflector is designed to direct exhaust gases away from the test stand during static fire testing. To shield against the intense heat of the Raptor exhaust plume, water will be sprayed through holes drilled into the deflector, forming a protective layer during testing. The water supply will be facilitated through underground channels currently under construction. The water storage tanks have already been installed. Work on the pipes connecting the propellant storage tanks to the test stand is underway. Upon completion, the new test stand will enable SpaceX to conduct longer and more powerful static fire tests compared to those currently conducted at the launch site. Super Heavy Booster 13 was rolled out to the Massey's test site on Thursday morning for cryogenic proof testing. The booster, which is currently slated for the sixth integrated flight test, will undergo cryo tests at the Massey's site in the coming days to ensure the reliability of the plumbing and provide engineers with the valuable data they need to determine whether it can endure various kinds of stresses during flight 6 and whether its structure has any leaks. Starship 31, intended to launch with booster 13, is currently housed in the high bay alongside ship 29. Meanwhile, Starship 30, which has already completed its cryo-proof test campaign, is inside Mega Bay 2, undergoing engine installation for static fire testing. Inside the Mega Bay, we have boosters 11 and 12, along with booster 14 sections. Ship 32, the final prototype of the first-generation Starships, is positioned in the Rocket Garden. SpaceX is aiming for up to nine Starship flights this year, as revealed by Kelvin Coleman, the FAA's Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation. The interval between Starship launches has significantly decreased from nearly seven months between flights one and two to just under four months between flights two and three. Flight four is targeted for May and could occur just two months after flight three. If the cadence of one Starship launch every two months continues, IFT-7 could take place in November, marking the fifth Starship flight in 2024. IFT-8 will introduce second-generation Starships with upgraded engines, increased propellant capacity, and potentially modified fins. However, considering the current launch frequency and production speed, achieving nine launches this year seems improbable. Also, only five Starship flights per year are currently permitted from Starbase, as per the final programmatic environmental assessment for the site passed in 2022. SpaceX has already applied for a waiver from the FAA. So, in short, regulatory approval is also necessary to achieve nine Starship flights this year. What do you think? Can SpaceX launch Starship nine times this year? Let me know in the comments below. Now, let's discuss some of the latest updates from the world of science and technology. In a historic launch on April 24, Rocket Lab successfully deployed a South Korean Earth observation satellite and a new NASA solar sail to orbit. The mission, which lifted off from Rocket Lab's Launch Complex 1 in New Zealand, was the company's fifth of the year and 47th electron launch to date. The primary payload of the mission, the new Space Earth Observation Satellite 1, or Neon Sat 1, is a South Korean Earth observation satellite equipped with a high-resolution optical camera designed to monitor natural disasters along the Korean peninsula by pairing its images with artificial intelligence. The satellite was deployed into a 520-kilometer circular Earth orbit about 50 minutes after liftoff. The secondary payload of the mission was NASA's Advanced Composite Solar Sail System, or ACS-3. 
The ACS-3 spacecraft, about the size of a microwave oven, is equipped with an 80-square-meter solar sail made of an ultra-thin reflective film. Just as a sailboat is powered by wind in a sail, solar sails employ the pressure of sunlight for propulsion. The sail will be positioned in such a way that photons from the sun can bounce off of the reflective sail to push the spacecraft forward. Because solar sailing is efficient and eliminates the need for conventional rocket propellants, NASA and other space agencies have high hopes for this relatively novel propulsion strategy. A few solar sailing missions have already flown, including Japan's Icaros spacecraft, launched in 2010, and the Planetary Society's light sail missions, launched in 2015 and 2019. NASA's ACS-3 mission aims to further develop the technology. The goal is to test a new composite boom made from flexible polymer and carbon fiber materials that is stiffer and lighter than previous boom designs. The boom can be folded up inside something as small as a CubeSat and still deploy and remain rigid once in space. After the deployment of NEON SAT-1, the Electron's kick stage reignited its Curie engine to raise its apogee and deployed the ACS-3 spacecraft into a 1,000-kilometer sun-synchronous orbit. The spacecraft then deployed its booms to a length of about 30 feet, or 9.1 meters. It took about 25 minutes for the solar sails to fully deploy, after which it measured 80 square meters. NASA mounted cameras onto the spacecraft to capture the deployment sequence, providing visual insight into its performance. In the coming days, the mission team will conduct a series of pointing maneuvers to showcase the spacecraft's ability to raise and lower its orbit using only the pressure of sunlight. Data obtained from the ACS-3 demonstration helped researchers evaluate the efficacy of the shape and design of the solar sail, characterize the thrust functionality of the sail, and design future larger-scale composite solar sails for missions to destinations like the Moon, Mars, and beyond. China launched its crewed Shenzhou-18 mission to the Tiangong Space Station atop a Long March 2F rocket on April 25, marking the country's 13th human spaceflight mission and the 7th to Tiangong. Aboard our mission commander Yi Guangfu, who was on the second crewed mission to the space station in 2021, and crewmates and former fighter pilots Li Kong and Li Guangzhu. The Shenzhou spacecraft carrying the crew members separated from the launch vehicle 10 minutes into the flight and began its journey towards the space station. The spacecraft is expected to make an automated docking with Tiangong about six and a half hours after liftoff. The astronauts will join the three-member Shenzhou 17 crew on board the station, who will return to Earth on April 30. During their six-month-long mission, the Shenzhou-18 astronauts will conduct various on-orbit tests and experiments in multiple fields. They will also perform spacewalks to carry out maintenance on the station. China aims to keep Tiangong constantly occupied and operational in orbit for at least 10 years, though it could be extended to 15 years. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.